The committee will come to order. Before we begin, I want to remind our members, our guests, and our staff that we are at the unclassified level for today's hearing. I am also obligated to remind the witnesses that providing false information to this committee or concealing material information from the committee is a crime punishable by law. Today we welcome Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, Deputy Secretary of Defense Robert Work, and the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence Marcel Letra, who will discuss the critical support that our intelligence community provides to our war fighters and the Department of Defense. Thank you for all three of you for being here today. The United States faces grave security threats today from terrorism threats to aggression by nation states to cyber attacks. The intelligence community provides our military with critical information across the full spectrum of conflict. Yet when the IC and DOD do not integrate effectively, we risk intelligence failures that put our warfighters' lives at risk. We are here today because the DOD and the IC have failed to adequately re respond to the concerns raised by this committee on a range of critical national security issues, including those raised by the committee during the worldwide threats hearing this past February. The committee is alarmed by the manipulation of intelligence at U.S. Central Command, as we documented in our August report. Further, an ongoing committee investigation has found that the DOD and the IC facilities planning has been plagued by significant flaws, including disregard for more cost-effective alternatives. Despite repeatedly raising these concerns, the committee has not seen any meaningful corrective actions by the DOD or the IC. I want to thank the Department of Defense Inspector General's Office for their ongoing investigations into both of these issues. Once they are complete, I will invite the IG to present their findings in open session. If necessary, we may ask the three of you to return following the conclusion of those investigations. I also commend the work of the Government Accountability Office, which recently released a report finding that the Department of Defense did not follow best practices when conducting its Joint Intelligence Analysis Complex Consolidation Analysis of Alternatives process. Thank you for being here, and with that, I would like to recognize the ranking member for any opening comments he would like to make. Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying to get used to this new committee uh, and, and the lap of luxury here in Ways and Means. Um, first, uh, I want to thank you all for your uh, many years of service to the country, uh, indeed decades of service to the country. Uh, Director Clapper, uh, in particular, I want to uh, thank you for honorably serving us since the 1960s, first as an Air Force officer, later as Director of DIA, NGA, and as uh, Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, and of course for the last six years of DNI. You took a position that was still very much in the process of formation. Uh, and gave it very substantive and effective content, and uh, we're very grateful for all you have done. You've always exhibited sober judgment and put the fate of the nation first. I hope that uh, as you look back on your career, um, you're, uh, you don't uh, lament your many appearances before us. Uh, we certainly don't. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a rumor out there that you might be asked to stay on a little longer during the transition. Uh, I'm hoping you will stay on a little longer, maybe four years longer. Um, but uh, that's probably the last thing you want to hear. Um, Deputy Secretary of Work and Under Secretary Letra, uh, I also want to thank you for your extraordinary service for the country. Uh, we're very grateful to both of you, and I look forward to uh, uh, our continued work together and whatever uh, plans uh, come to you both down the road. As we, end the, and as we near the end of the Congress, and now is an appropriate time to reflect on the values that uh, shape our work and how those are manifest in the national security domain. Uh, our country is best served when we put aside partisanship and conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the American people. Uh, this requires a commitment to intellectual honesty, respect for the rule of law, and a willingness to accept accountability for our mistakes, the responsibility to learn from them, and the commitment to avoid repeating them. Uh, as we've done on this committee, we must all work together to solve problems on a bipartisan, really nonpartisan basis. Uh, the intelligence community and at times the military operate in the shadows, uh, but that no way diminishes our responsibility to ensure 
uh, that we act according to these principles, in fact, responsibility is even greater. Uh, at home, we rely on our military and intelligence community to be nonpartisan, objective, and honest about the challenges we face. Uh, and that candor is what allows the most senior leaders in this country to make hard choices about how to protect Americans. Abroad, even as we engage in espionage and warfare to protect ourselves and our allies and world stability itself, uh, we again rely on the IC and the military to comport with the rule of law and the highest moral standards. Uh, even in the shadows, uh, we must all uh, act as if you're very much in the spotlight because you are. Uh, the world often sees what we're doing. The intelligence committees uh, do our best to shine a light in a constructive way. Uh, the people expect and deserve an intelligence community and military that are responsive and transparent as possible to the public uh, and open to the oversight committees. The intelligence oversight committees in Congress act as a critical check on the most secret activities of the IC and the DOD uh, and also provide oversight, we hope sound judgment, and ultimately either authorization or dis disapproval. Each of us must continually seek to strike the right balance between protecting privacy and civil liberties and ensuring our security. That balance is not always clear. It is never a bright line, uh, and nor have we always achieved it to perfection. But it always must be our goal in the IC, in the Department of Defense, and here in Congress. So today I look forward to a far-reaching discussion about how the IC can and does support the Department of Defense uh, as we on HIPSI pursue our meaningful, comprehensive, and bipartisan oversight of the critical work that you all do now and into the future. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. I want to uh, let the witnesses know that we do have your opening uh, statements for the record. I want to uh, keep uh, your opening statements to no more than five minutes because we have a lot of questions. Uh, and I think we will have a series of votes. And so I want to get through as many of those questions as possible. Uh, and who, uh, who's going to start off? Uh, Director Clapper, will you start off? Director Clapper, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman News, Ranking Member Schiff, members of the committee, um, and thanks to the Ranking Member for your very uh, gracious uh, comments. Um, I uh, submitted my letter of resignation last night, which felt pretty good. I got uh, 64 days left, and I think uh, I'd have a hard time with my wife, uh, anything past that. Uh, thanks for having us uh, here today to discuss the intelligence community's uh, support to the Department of Defense. I'm joined today, of course, by uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work, and my partner, Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Marcel Letter, and to the two men whom I greatly admire. And uh, <clears throat> we'll certainly do our best to discuss as much of the um, IC support to the Department in this unclassified environment, obviously noting that some uh, details may require follow-up in a classified setting. My written statement, I included a brief update on some of the national security challenges that this committee knows well. So in the interest of time, I think I'll uh, skip by those. Uh, you're well familiar with them. Just to, as a stage setter for uh, the constant challenges that we face. As I said before this committee many times, our nation's facing the most diverse array of threats that I've seen in my 53 plus years in the intelligence business. And that, that's what makes the topic of this hearing so important. Never before have the intelligence community and the Department of Defense needed to work so closely. We have a shared responsibility to keep our nation safe and secure. I have a long history of serving in the department in intelligence roles to include as the director of intelligence for three of the combatant commands, as director of both DIA and NGA for almost nine years, as Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence for over three years, and as commander of a scientific Intelli technical intelligence center, as commander of a SIGINT wing, and I served two combat tours uh, during the Southeast Asia conflict. So I have experienced firsthand the department and IC's collaboration. Since the stand-up of ODNI, the relationship between the department and the community has grown steadily closer. When I first took over as USDI in 2007, I established a dual hat relationship for the US USDI with within ODNI. It's called the Director of Defense Intelligence, or DDI. And this position serves as a bridge to enhance an integration, collaboration, and information sharing between the intelligence community and DOD. And Marcel, I must say, has taken this arrangement to the next level. ODNI does the hard work of integrating behind the scenes, so it's never a thought, or shouldn't be, on the front lines. 
My written statement walks through several examples from operational support to acquisition oversight to innovations by IARPA that illustrate the support the IC renders to DOD. But in the interest of time, let me give you one real tangible example of how this works every day. And that is Joint Duty, a program championed and managed by ODNI. DOD knows well how jointness brings great value to the warfighter, and we in the IC adopted this same approach. We learned the hard way how still piping and insula insular approaches to intelligence are not the way to operate. To penetrate those still pipes, one of the most valuable tools is joint duty, where IC officers serve rotations outside of their home agencies. This is intelligence integration at the most basic level, person to person. The IC's policy not only fosters joint duty, it mandates it for anyone who seeks to become a senior officer. And literally thousands of IC officers have completed joint duty assignments. This is in stark contrast to my war in Southeast Asia, where you rarely saw civilian employees in the war zone. Today, civilians and service members are serving shoulder to shoulder, focusing on the same mission, sharing the same risks, and enduring the same challenging circumstances. And I saw a yet more recent graphic example of that in my visit to Kuwait last week. I cite joint duty as just one of the many ways that we build strong bridges between the IC and DOD. Finally, I want to take note of the fact that Secretary Carter recently presented me with the Department of Defense Distinguished Public Service Award the highest such award that he can give. The award was not for me. I accepted it on behalf of the men and women of the intelligence community who worked tirelessly to support our missions, many of them directly supporting the warfighters. An award is a symbol of that commitment to mission, and I want to publicly thank the Secretary for so honoring us, the intelligence community. So, <clears throat> and uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, just, uh, I did want to comment specifically on, com on uh, the issue of, of analytic integrity at uh, CENTCOM. This has some very recent information I thought would be useful to share, share with you. Since we have now 2016 results of our analytic, and survey, so analytic uh, survey, which reflected that 22 percent of CENTCOM, J2, and JIOC Analysts, respondents experience objectivity issues. This represents a decrease from 41% in 2015 and is comparable to the 16% who reported issues in 2014. CENTCOM J2 objectivity numbers are on par with the 2016 combat command average of 25% and slightly higher than 2016 IC wide average of 17%. They also indicate that CENTCOM, J2, and JIOC respondents experiencing objectivity issues were more likely to seek assistance to resolve incidents. 60% of CENTCOM, J2 respondents experiencing objectivity issues sought assistance up from 42% in 2015. Of those seeking assistance in resolving objectivity issues at CENTCOM, J2, and JIOC in 2016, 67% rated seniors CENTCOM intelligence management is satisfactory at protecting analytic products from deliberate distortion. So I, I mention this only to make this is a you know one year period, but it does show a, a positive trend. And I would also comment that, of course, there's been a change in both the commander and uh, the J2 and CENTCOM. And uh, I think just that, not to I'm not casting aspersions on the prior incumbents. I just think that this, a change has been a, a very positive development. So with that, I'll stop and, and turn to Secretary Work. Thank, thank you, Director. Uh, Deputy Secretary Work, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Nunez, ranking membership. Did you get the uh, mic, please? Sorry, sir. Director, thank you. Chairman Nunez, ranking membership, distinguished uh, members of the committee. It's an honor to appear before you today to discuss the support of the Department of Defense has received from the intelligence community. As uh, Chairman Nunez said, this is the unclassified uh, uh, hearing, so I precludes me from getting into any specific details. So let me just state that the support that we receive from the IC community has been absolutely superb. It's great to be here with the Director of uh, National Intelligence, Jim Clapper. There's nobody more qualified. Jim, I'd like to state for the record that uh, Marcel has been tasked by me to find your letter of resignation and lose it. Uh, because we would certainly like to see you stay as long as possible. But as Jim gets ready to hang up his spurs, uh, I want to say that Secretary Carter and I are exceedingly 
grateful to his tremendous contributions to the intel uh, intelligence community and intelligence support to DOD. He knows better than anyone the value of the DOD's eight members of the IC bring to the intelligence arena. Marcel Letra, who's down here, is my, also my battle buddy in uh, intelligence in the Department of Defense. He's the primary intelligence advisor to the Secretary and me. He's also responsible to Jim in the role of the Director for Defense Intelligence. This dual hat role was established and institutionalized when Jim was the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. And it has been a smashing success in our opinion. So I can't overstate the importance of having a USDI team who understands the warfighting requirements, is plugged in closely with the IC community, and appreciates the entire capabilities the IC can bring to bear. Now, we all understand and appreciate the importance of these personal relationships, which is why I comment on them. And thanks to Jim, Marcel, CIA Director John Brin, and the directors of the Combat Support Agencies, the relationship, in our view, between DNI, CIA, the rest of the three, the rest of three of the intelligence communities and DOD have never been better. Uh, I've worked in this business now for a little bit over two and a half years. I've had an opportunity to work not only closely with Jim, but with his principal deputy, Stephanie O'Sullivan. She's one of the three members, along with the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Paul Selva. Uh, we chair the Advanced Capability and Deterrence Panel, which indicates the close relationship we have uh, between the IC and the department. These relationships and cooperation are absolutely crucial as we seek to allocate our intelligence sources to meet the challenges that Jim spoke about around the world, from fighting ISIL and other extremist groups, monitoring North Korea's very active ballistic missile and nuclear weapons program, ensuring Iran does not develop further nuclear capability, keeping a watchful eye on Russia's actions in the Ukraine, Eastern Europe, and elsewhere, and scrutinizing China's activities in the South and East China Sea. The demands on the intelligence community are formidable, and the IC is working as best as they can, and we would consider their job to be outstanding to try to apply scarce intelligence resources across all of these challenges. The USDI and DNI rely upon several joint forums where the uh, Joint Service Intelligence Chiefs, the Intelligence Com um, Combatant Support Agencies, CIA and the DNI uh, convene. And uh, these are regular visit include regular visits to all of our regional and functional combatant commands, participation in the Afghan and the counter ISIL warfighter senior integration groups, which we call the uh, Warfighting SIG. And all of these are designed to address the warfighter's most urgent operational needs. We have 10 combatant commands who have IC representatives on them. That is another indication of how close our relationship is. And their robust presence, in, even in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and other places worldwide, especially in this zero-sum budget environment, uh, really speaks highly for the mission orient, uh, orientation of the entire IC. So I'm very grateful to be here today, uh, and I'm very grateful for the committee's interest in this area, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Deputy Secretary. Uh, uh, Mr. Undersecretary, do you have an opening statement? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not have a formal opening statement. I would just like to briefly make two points. Uh, first is, as uh, Director Clapper and Deputy Secretary Work have, have uh, indicated, <coughs> um, I essentially have two reporting chains uh, reporting to DNI Clapper on the intelligence community side and to the Deputy Secretary and the Secretary on the DOD side with really my full-time focus and my team's full-time focus being to manage and focus the relationship between the intelligence community and the military and ensure that in both directions the military is providing support to the intelligence community and the intelligence community is providing support to the military. I think we've had a, a, a very interesting transformative experience since 9-11 um, in fundamentally integrating those efforts uh, far more than ever before, and I look forward to uh, touching on some of that in the questions and answers today. And the second point, Mr. Chairman, is just to echo uh, the thanks that have been uh, provided ar around the table this morning. Thanks to um, the uh, team that I've been able to serve with here on this side, Director Clapper and the Secretary and Deputy. 
uh, but also to this committee. Uh, I suspect that this will be my last opportunity to uh, appear before you um, before the transition in government in January. Uh, I, uh, at an early point in my career, had an opportunity and honor really to serve as a staff member on this committee uh, for three years, which was um, an opportunity to learn about the importance of oversight and the, the, the critical um, driver that oversight can be in ensuring that government functions effectively. And I want to just thank the committee for that opportunity early in my career to be able to do that, as well as to have a productive relationship over many years since. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Undersecretary, and that's actually a good segue uh, into our opening questions. Uh, we are here uh, in open, a rare open session for this committee uh, because we have struggled to get a lot of answers and provide transparency uh, to the public, which is really one of our most important constitutional duties that we have as a legislative branch of government. I have some, I have many questions that I want to get through, so I want to try if we can keep your answers uh, as short and, and concise as possible. Uh, first, I wanna, I'm gonna start, uh, and maybe we'll just start with you, Mr. Letcher. This is for all of you. Are you uh, familiar with Wikipedia, the free online encyclopedia? Yes, I am. Mr. Clapper? Generally, Gen generally, yeah. generally, yes, sir. Does the Department of Defense or the intelligence community edit Wikipedia pages on behalf of the U.S. government? I really can't speak authoritatively on that. I know I've, I personally have never edited a Wikipedia page. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I, I don't think so, but I, I don't know. Mr. Wirt. I have no uh, knowledge whether or not uh, it happens or not, sir. Okay. Does the DOD or the IC use Wikipedia as an official source of information? I just don't know, uh, Congressman. I would have to look into that. I don't know offhand if it, if it has ever been. I don't know. I know that the department and the IC community uses a lot of open source information. I don't know whether or not Wikipedia is one of those open sources. Okay. Well, Deputy Secretary Work, on March 21st, you and Director Clapper met with Chairman Thornberry, Chairman Freelingheisen, and myself to discuss the analysis required by the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2016 regarding the Joint Intelligence Analysis Complex slated to be built at the Crowton Air Base in the UK. Do you, re do you recall that meeting? I do indeed, sir. Uh, Director Clapper, do you recall that meeting? Yes, I do. Secretary Work, you informed the committee that Department of De Defense did not intend to fully reevaluate re lower cost, cost alternative sites for the Intelligence Center. As justification for your decision, you provided the committee with two documents uh, regarding communications infrastructure supporting Lajes Field in Portugal's Azores Islands. Uh, I'm gonna ask the clerk to please distribute Exhibit 1 and Exhibit 2, which includes one of the documents provided as justification for the department's decision. Everybody has uh, the documents now. Um, Secretary of Work, are you aware that significant portions of this document that you passed to three committee chairmen to meet a public law were plagiarized from Wikipedia? Well, sir, I can state with certainty that I did not uh, provide Exhibit 2. Uh, I have never seen Exhibit 2. Uh, well, I can, I can help explain it. Exhibit 2. Uh, are the Wikipedia pages that were plagiarized for Exhibit 1 that you provided to meet the public law? I see. Uh, no, I did not know that uh, so. the information in that document came from Wikipedia. Okay, so you can see basically all of the graphics in this, what you provided us, everything that's highlighted, that was all taken directly out of what we have in Exhibit 2 to provide to three committee chairmen to fulfill 
the, national, the requirements of the National Defense Authorization Act. Well, if I may, sir, I would just like to clarify what I did in that meeting. I was required by the National Defense Authorization Act to make a determination that our movement to Crowton was operationally the right uh, call to make, and I made that determination and uh, communicated my intent to do that. The second thing I needed to do was to certify that there were no DOD missions that could be transferred to Lodges, uh, and I certified that we were not intending to do so. Uh, at that meeting, you asked me uh, two questions. Uh, you said, what about the housing uh, costs on, uh, in Lodges? And you questioned me on the uh, communications information. I provided you a piece of doc, on one document that was provided to me, I think it was by DISA, and I committed to you to make a deep dive, uh, which I did. Well, I'm just alarmed, uh, Secretary Work, that we would rely on Wikipedia, free online encyclopedia that's famously known for most high school students plagiarizing their homework. Um, and that you would even, that the Department of Defense would even use Wikipedia a free online service to provide any information to Congress to put in any report. Well, again, Mr. Chairman, this had no bearing on my determination or my certification, which was required by law. So you're not bothered at all that the Department of Defense, a hundred and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars agency, that anyone in your department would be providing you information to give to the Congress that was plagiarized. And it's not just it was plagiarized off of Wikipedia, it was every single graph in the document was taken from Wikipedia. Well, again, sir, the, uh, the cost for the cables and the cables were not dispositive. You're not, Secretary Work, you're not answering the question here. Um, you know, we need to know whether or not it's I'm appropriate, surprised. is uh, it appropriate to take information off of Wikipedia and provide it to the Congress? Um, I would say that I'm surprised that this uh, comes directly from a Wikipedia page. Okay. All right, let me uh, move on because we are going to have votes. Uh, are you aware that the committee first asked for the bandwidth requirements for this intelligence center in er early August 2015? Yes, sir, I am. Are you aware that the committee again requested communications requirements on May 24th, 2016? Yes, sir, I am. Are you aware the committee again requested requirements on October 5th, 2016? Um, I'm not certain of the exact dates, but I know that we have been in communication. Yes, sir. Are you aware that the committee finally received this information on the Intelligence Center uh, requirements earlier this week? I am. On Tuesday, the Department of Defense uh, uh, Chief Information Officer testified before this committee that Department of Defense leadership decided not to brief committee staff because of the tone of a letter sent, to, sent from the committee to the Department of Defense. Did you direct the Department of Defense CIO not to provide the requested information to the committee because of the tone of a letter? No, I did not, but I would like to uh, explain what, in my view, has happened. You called me in September 2015. As the Chief Operating Officer of the Department of Defense, I oversee developing a defense program for the Secretary in accordance with his strategic guidance. As a result, I am responsible for every single aspect of that program. And as you can imagine, certain, uh, certain items do not rise to my level of attention, and certain do. In September 2015, you called me and asked me to personally get involved in reviewing the information that was being provided. And I committed to you that I would. We briefed you and chair, uh, the two other chairmen in March. Uh, at that point, you brought up new information that was new to me. You said, I don't believe that you're being served right in the information on the uh, uh, communications, and I don't think you're being served right by the information on housing. I committed you to do a deep dive, which we did. That deep dive was finished in May. Since May, we have been trying to get that information to you. From the very beginning, Mr. Chairman, I thought this was a communication between you and me. You asked me to do this personally for you. All of the interactions that I had were with you and the other chairman, and we offered to provide this information to you. We were told that you would not want to receive it. 
We actually had a hearing scheduled in September, which was postponed. I regret that this information uh, was not communicated, but we have had the information since March, uh, excuse me, since May, and we have been trying to commu uh, communicate it to you. Yeah, so, the, so the issue with, with this is, it was your chief information officer refused to, or the department, I shouldn't say you, or, or, or the chief information officer said, the reason that you would not brief the committee staff was because of a, the tone of a letter. Uh, but I, you did remind me of one thing, and that I do remember that phone call, and I just, for the record, you do acknowledge that I informed you that the Congress had been given false or misleading information. I, in that September I phone call. Under, I understood that was your opinion. Yes, sir. Okay, so you were informed by this committee that, that we were provided false and misleading information and by I the Department found of no Defense. no indication that that was true. So I'm going to pass out the uh, email, this Exhibit 3, uh, that went from our staff to the Department of Defense because I'd like to just ask you what is the problem with the what is the problem with the tone of this letter that would lead the Department of Defense not to send us the requirements for an intelligence center? Mr. Chairman, I haven't seen this uh, particular one. All I can tell you is you asked me in March to do a deep dive, and I got the absolute best experts in the Department of Defense to do that deep dive. It included the chief information right, but this officer. Is, but this is where the legislative branch of government, we asked in August of 2015, and your chief information officer said that he was told by superiors not to provide the information because of the tone of a letter. This is the letter. And I mean, to me, it seems like a very nice letter. It says, thank you for the quick reply. It even says, uh, thanks for the help. Mr. Is there Chairman, a problem with the know. tone of this letter? Mr. Chairman, I don't know what letter uh, Mr. Halverson was talking about. What I can say is that what I have, ever since our first meeting, I said it is very important to the three chairmen that we provide this information to them. I want to deal directly with the chairman. I want to provide them with the best information that we have. Everything that you ask or any of the other chairman asks, we take very I, I appreciate that, but, but your department, as testimony from just two days ago, decided not to send information to this committee because of the tone of a letter, and this is the letter. And I don't see anything wrong with the tone of the letter. Well, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned uh, the, uh, at the early part of the hour that there are two investigations ongoing, one by this uh, committee and one by the DODIG, made at your request. Normally, when an IG investigation occurs, we stop all uh, interactions with the committees. But we have said, because this is so important to the chairman, we will continue the interaction with the chairman and we will be very careful and deliberate on the way that we come forward. Um, I regret that uh, Mr. Halverson used the term tone. Uh, I have instructed everyone that we need to be very deliberate because of the close attention that you have placed to this. And I have emphasized to everyone in the chain of command that our, uh, all of our analysis has to be unimpeachable. And so, so, so okay. Deputy Secretary, I just want to, uh, I understand there are two investigations ongoing, uh, but just so you know, this was in August, this was August 3rd of 2015. Uh, the letter to the DOD IG requesting an investigation was not until nine months later. So why for nine months did you not, did your department decide not to provide basic, what is really basic information to this committee? Again, sir, when you asked me to get uh, involved in this, I did. Uh, I've ordered the deep dive. I have absolute confidence that the J6 on the joint staff, the CIO, DISA, and DIA now have come together, worked the information that you requested. So, so clearly, Deputy Secretary, you're not responsible for not providing the information, or you don't recall that, but someone in your department told the CIO that. So do you know who, who would have instructed the CIO not to provide the information because of the tone of a letter? I don't believe anyone did, and I don't believe that uh, uh, Mr. Halverson was trying to uh, make any aspersion. We believe congressional oversight is extraordinarily uh, important. 
since the meeting with you in March. We've had six separate letters, I believe. We've provided over 1,000 pages of documents. We've provided 11 people to testify before the committee. Uh, there are people being, te uh, being testified. We believe we have been extraordinarily responsive. I would, you well, mentioned the GAO I'd like, report. I'd like, to, I'd like to talk about the, uh, the uh, responsiveness. This committee's investigation has uncovered multiple instances where the Department of Defense provided information to other committees, particularly the Senate Armed Services Committee, months before providing the same information to this committee. Is it the DOD's policy to provide information to the Senate before providing it to the House? No, sir, it is not. Then why did it happen? Again, sir, uh, we have offered to uh, brief this information to you since May, and uh, twice, once when you... This has nothing to do with that, Secretary of Work. This has to do with information that we asked a year and a half ago that we did not receive. We'll, we'll go on. On, uh, on. on Monday, the Department of Defense finally provided the committee with the communications requirements. I understand that Lodge's infrastructure, as it, con as it is configured today, does not have the desired bandwidth. Did the DOD ever ask telecommunications providers if they could upgrade their infrastructure to support the specific requirements? Mr. Chairman, I would defer all questions to the experts in the J6, the CIO, DISA, and DIA. However, I have been briefed that it is not normal policy for us to go out and say, what is the art of the possible in the future? We do all our analysis on what is available today. So when the, when the DOD CIO testified before us two days ago, uh, he did uh, uh, indicate that they did not ask the local uh, provider. So now I have, a, you know, this is the same question I asked the other day, which is when our bases around the world need extra bandwidth, do we just not ask and we just start laying cables all over the globe? Or do we ask the local provider, can we increase our bandwidth? Sir, you have to put this within the context of what this question is about. What was better, Crouton or Logis? There is no comparison. Crouton is absolutely the best information that's, hub. That's not the question. The question was, is could the communications infrastructure meet the requirements or not? I understand that was the that question. That was the question. But the question you posed to me was whether or not the movement to Crouton was operating how do you how do you know the answer if you don't even if you never ask the provider if the local communications infrastructure would work I know the answer sir because CAPE who is the best independent cost analysis section that we have in the Department of Defense took a look at all of the one-time costing factors they looked at seven in all of them there was never an instance where CAPE was able to close the business case for logic. Yeah, we, we, we were briefed on the CAPE uh, study. Uh, it was quite, quite entertaining. Let me, uh, uh, on September 1st, 2016, you sent a letter to the committee stating that you released funding for phase two of the Intelligence Center construction. When did you release the funding? R soon after that uh, letter, I assume, sir. Soon after the letter that was dated on September 1st. Um, I cannot tell you the exact dates that money transferred, but that was the date that I notified you that we were going to go forward. Yes. There would be no reason to, for the, this notification would have been delayed. I can't imagine one, sir. Uh, now, it might have been delayed simply because of the staffing process of the letter coming up through me. I, I go through hundreds and hundreds of uh, pages, so perhaps it was delayed slightly. At uh, the time of your decision, was there an active GAO investigation into this location? into the analysis on this location? Um, there was an AOA going, uh, an analysis of our AOA, yes. I would uh, at the time of your decision, was there an active DOD IG investigation into DOD personnel providing false information to Congress related to this intelligence center? Yes, and I believe it is ongoing now. Secretary Letra, I want to understand how DOD sets requirements for the locations of facilities. We asked you this question earlier this year in closed session, but I want to make sure it's on the record today as well. Does the Department of Defense choose locations, location of facilities based upon where personnel want to live? We do not. We have a range of factors that <clears throat> go into the decisions about where to base facilities, and particularly when it comes to intelligence facilities, the uh, operational uh, mission orientation and criteria associated with that so, are the greatest of the factors. So we, so we choose location of intelligence facilities based upon mission requirements? That's one of a, of a range of criteria that, that do factor in.
But uh, for me, wearing my intelligence hat and with my intelligence responsibilities, uh, the, the mission relevance and the uh, ability of that location to service the intelligence mission uh, tends to rise to the top of the list, yes. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop here and we'll come back later, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yield to the uh, ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Clapper, I wanted to uh, ask you about your uh, uh, parting thoughts on Russia and the threat posed by Russia. Um, you and the Secretary of uh, Homeland Security acknowledged uh, about a month ago that Russia had been hacking in our political institutions and uh, interfering with our election and that this was coming from the highest levels of the uh, Kremlin. Um, what is your assessment of whether that activity is likely to continue uh, into the next administration um, if uh, President-elect Trump uh, if a rapprochement between he and uh, Mr. Putin doesn't materialize, uh, would you anticipate that the Russians will uh, hack and dump documents that might be damaging to a Trump administration? Uh, would that uh, be consistent with what you know of their playbook? Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the question, sir. Uh, I, I don't anticipate uh, a significant change in uh, Russian behavior. Um, we gave considerable thought to uh, diming out Russia with that statement. Uh, we waited until we felt we had sufficient uh, basis for it, and we did, and both from a forensic and as well as other sources of intelligence that led us to that uh, statement. It may have had uh, the desired effect since uh, after that, uh, uh, after the issuance of the statement and the communication that I know took place between our government and the Russian government, it seemed to uh, curtailed uh, the uh, cyber activity that the Russians were previously engaged in. The Russians have a very uh, active and aggressive uh, capability to uh, conduct information operations, so-called hybrid warfare. Uh, that's been a long-standing practice of theirs going back to the Soviet era, and uh, I anticipate that uh, it will uh, continue. Director, I want to uh, drill down a little further uh, into your comment that the Russian activity curtailed uh, after the issuance of the statement. Um, the Dumping of documents uh, didn't end uh, with the issuance of the statement. Um, are you implying by this that uh, uh, that we know whether the documents provided to either cutouts or WikiLeaks uh, had all been provided prior to the statement that was issued, or uh, is it is it entirely possible that the dumping of documents continued after the statement? Uh, uh, and what may have been avoided was a uh, further escalation of the interference in the form of uh, trying to monkey around on election day or thereafter. I was referring to the uh, cyber reconnaissance that we had observed, many states had, state entities had, had observed uh, prior to the statement. And the, that act, sort of activity seemed to uh, have uh, curtailed. As far as the uh, WikiLeaks uh, connection, the evidence there is uh, not uh, as strong, and we don't have good insight into uh, the sequencing of the releases uh, or when the, when the data may have been provided. We don't, we don't have uh, as good insight into that. And based on uh, what the Russians have done in Europe and elsewhere, what would you anticipate uh, they would uh, do uh, during the coming administration in terms of their hacking and, and dumping uh, and uh, active measures campaign in the United States. Director, I think your microphone is off again. That's hard to say, uh, uh, Congressman Schiff. I, I don't, I can't say what they'll do and uh, I can't uh, forecast uh, what the impact of uh, our new administration uh, might have on uh, Russian behavior. That's uh, kind of speculative. I just, I just don't know. 
Uh, let me ask you about their, what you can tell us about their intentions vis-a-vis -vis the Minsk Accords and uh, Ukraine. Uh, do you see uh, any uh, intensification of Russian efforts to disrupt uh, the Ukraine or destabilize the Ukraine government? Uh, or uh, do you see efforts in the opposite direction? Uh, are Russian incentives aligned to uh, tamping down the violence there or, or dialing it up at this point? I think uh, for now they will uh, sustain their presence in the Donbass. Uh, we continue to see uh, firing incidents uh, exchanged along the line of contact and recently since uh, yet another reaffirmation of the ceasefire, the number of incidents per week has increased. Uh, I think uh, both countries will probably engage in uh, actions and counteractions uh, to try to promote uh, instability. And clearly the, uh, the Russians want to sustain uh, influence uh, in uh, a, a traditional part of greater Russia, which is uh, Ukraine. And so I, th I suspect that sort of pressure will continue. I don't see much prospect for uh, a resolution or, co or compliance with the Minsk uh, Accords, I think would just continue this sort of semi-stalemate we're in. Um, in terms of Russian uh, conduct in the war in Syria, uh, Obviously, uh, Putin and the Kremlin are aware that the incoming president wants to have a different relationship with Russia. How do you see that as influencing uh, their policy in Syria? Uh, are, is the Kremlin likely to conclude by that that they have more or less a green light to continue the siege of Aleppo or the bombing of civilians? Uh, do you ascribe any significance to the timing of their resumption of that campaign following uh, the discussion with the president-elect? I, I can't. Uh, speculate on what impact, again, what impacts uh, any discussions with the new administration would have, but I can tell you right now the Russians are sustaining their behavior. Um, they are pr can increasingly putting more pressure on uh, oppositionists in Aleppo, um, indiscriminately bombing uh, women, children, hospitals, this sort of thing, and that will continue. That is having a uh, negative effect on the oppositionists in terms of morale and willingness to, to continue to fight. And of course this plays to uh, Assad's objective of achieving a, a military uh, victory and that is the, the position he's in. I think he's probably less interested in any, any form of negotiations. Um, do you foresee uh, any change in the increasing Russian belligerence vis-a-vis -vis NATO countries? Uh, their uh, provocative acts in the air and in the sea. Uh, do you see any changes in that uh, in light of uh, a uh, potentially different relationship between the president-elect and, and the Kremlin? Well, uh, no, I don't, right, at least right now. The Russians recently uh, deployed their lone carrier uh, and are conducting some ops uh, off of that. They have um, sustained the presence of their uh, artillery uh, and the deployment of a very advanced uh, air defense systems. Uh, and so at least I, I think that what that indicates that uh, clearly the Russians are there to stay. They want to maintain uh, uh, the, pre the presence and the, the, the base in Syria is their only base outside the, the former Soviet Union, a permanent base that they maintain and they, I expect will, uh, they're planning on expanding their presence at Tartus to support naval operations uh, in the Eastern Med. Uh, let me ask one last question on Russia, uh, sort of the 30,000 foot question, uh, and that is one aspect of the Putin doctrine has been to uh, enhance his own stature at home by uh, provoking confrontation with the West, uh, by uh, um, framing for his people at home, uh, the United States, as the, uh, you know, the Russian equivalent of the great Satan. Um, how will he square that uh, with uh, his uh, comments uh, or overtures to the president-elect? Uh, in other words, 
does the Kremlin need the American boogeyman uh, to maintain popularity at home, uh, and how will they deal with that uh, conflict uh, if there's a different relationship between the president-elect and the Kremlin? Well, uh, all I can say here is that uh, clearly uh, Putin has played to uh, this spirit of nationalism, if you want to call it that, in Russia by appealing to the citizenry uh, and, and I think more, somewhat as uh, a distraction uh, for or at least uh, offer compensation for the economic privations that a Russian population continues to suffer because of their, uh, the economic straits they're in and the continued contraction of their economy. And so he does uh, exhort and appeal to the patriotic spirit of the Russian people and uh, to conjure up uh, um, his standing up to uh, opponents in the West, notably the United States, and as a way of uh, reaffirming uh, in their minds uh, so a Russian greatness. Um, let me ask uh, one last question, both uh, Director Clapper and Secretary Work. Um, uh, about ISIS uh, and the campaign in, in Syria. Um, there have been a number of statements uh, from the Pentagon uh, about the timing of the campaign uh, uh, against Raqqa. Uh, and uh, I've had concerns about whether we have the forces ready to undertake that, whether it's premature. Um, but, you know, there have been public comments about uh, two imperatives of accelerating that campaign. One is an intensification of plotting by ISIS against the United States in Raqqa and the need to move quickly uh, uh, to diminish that threat. Uh, and the other is the fear of people, uh, ISIS figures, leaving Mosul uh, and reinforcing uh, efforts in Raqqa. Um, how much uh, are those two concerns driving the timing of that campaign? Uh, and uh, how do you ascribe the threat to the United States from ISIS at the moment uh, in terms of their external operations planning uh, and the, uh, the military trade-off of moving more quickly than maybe the forces are prepared, but the necessity of cutting people off that are fleeing uh, Mosul? Thanks for the question, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, the campaign design, which was settled on about a year ago today, is generally going along the lines of which we expected. It always was to isolate Mosul and Raqqa and then to reduce them. We are farther ahead in, uh, on the Mosul campaign because we have reliable partners on the ground. Uh, the Iraqi security forces, especially their counterterrorism service, have really been getting after the bad guys. Throughout this time, we've been providing a lot of support and going after the external operations leaders, both in Iraq and Syria. That's uh, the president's and the secretary's and everybody's number one concern, going after the external ops guys. And we are really having a lot of success in doing so. Uh, the campaign to re uh, isolate and reduce Raqqa uh, was always number two in the queue. Uh, this uh, SDF, uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces, are the isolation force, and they are in the process of isolating Raqqa. And the force that will ultimately um, reduce Raqqa uh, is now being determined among all of the actors in the region. Uh, meanwhile, we continue to hit every single external ops, uh, uh, external ops guy, either uh, al-Nusra Front uh, or al-Qaeda, in Syria or ISIL, and uh, we are having a lot of success in doing so. I don't think we can uh, ma make a direct correlation between as the pressure increases on the caliphate and it shrinks that we can relate that directly. We don't have any evidence that that somehow heightens the, the uh, threat to the homeland or threat of uh, external attack. That's been a constant uh, with ISIL uh, anyway. And I don't think there's a direct relationship between diminishment of their territory and the magnitude of that threat. It's still a, a concern of ours. As Secretary Work indicates, uh, uh, we've had a lot of success in taking out uh, both uh, 
uh, leaders of the external uh, operations and, and, uh, and some of their uh, lesser, lower level people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now I yield back. Mr. Conaway is recognized for five minutes. Well, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, I hadn't intended to ask this, but since the uh, ranking member is pursuing it, Russia today, the propaganda arm of, the, of uh, Putin, it's uh, well funded, really effective, RT, the television programs. They have a scheme, a playbook that says uh, if we can force the Americans to question each other um, about what's going on in their country, that uh, and they win. How does the ranking member's line of questioning uh, relative to trying to create some sort of a sinister link between whatever Mr. Trump might or might have done versus uh, uh, Putin, how does that play into the playbook that RT has been successful at, in your opinion? As, as trained professionals, uh, intelligence professionals, is that, in fact, exactly what RT is trying to get done, trying to get us to do? Well, they've uh, uh, incurred some budget cuts, uh, the RT network, and uh, have not been all that successful in conveying messages here in the United States. Now, they do uh, certainly broadcast elsewhere, and that's exactly what they try to do, uh, particularly in Europe. If, uh, having traveled there and watched uh, RT, they, they are focusing much more, I think, on Europe than, than the United States. Well, but it is their playbook, though, to, if you look at what they did in Ukraine and other places, to get the citizens to turn on themselves to, uh, to go after it. So it appears to me that that, uh, that whole line of uh, questioning that you're going to hear all, all day today will be uh, playing directly into the, uh, the uh, RT's uh, playbook, uh, and they are quite successful in Europe. Uh, and, uh, and they're coming here as well. Um, turning from that, though, the, uh, we've been at a fight in Afghanistan and Iraq for a long, long time. Can you, uh, surely we're better at uh, coordinating intelligence, providing intelligence to DOD. Can you uh, give us two or three examples where we are better today than we were when we first started this, uh, you know, with some lessons learned kind of thing that are now part of the, the norm versus what happened uh, in, uh, you mean in started. terms of, sh of, of sharing intelligence with yes. DOD? Yeah, well, g gathering it, sharing it, and, and just get, are, are you guys better today than you were in 2003 when this thing started? Oh, I think so. All right, uh, so can you give us a, two or three examples of where that's the case? Well, uh, I, I don't think I can go into specifics in this setting. I do know uh, I, can, uh, I visited uh, Kuwait and uh, the task force command there uh, last week and was uh, briefed on some very graphic examples of the contributions that the national agencies make, uh, specifically NSA, NGA, and DIA, uh, to uh, the warfighting uh, effort there. And uh, General Townsend, uh, very high in his praise of uh, what the uh, uh, intelligence community is doing on his behalf. And of course, this is, I think, emblematic of the relationship because of the fact that these are combat support agencies in DOD as well, as, as, as well as uh, parts of the intelligence community. Let me ask I'm happy to uh, give you specific examples uh, 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 that will be classified that would illustrate That'd that. That'd be fine. Uh, you mentioned joint duty and the, and the successes that's gone. Uh, early on, I had some questions as to um, the impact it would have on the personnel's uh, career paths if they'd left. Uh, their home agency or home uh, ent uh, units and went somewhere else. Uh, can you talk to us about the impact it's had on career development for those folks who have participated by going to other agencies, as well as uh, are commanders uh, willing to, to give up their best and brightest to go to, uh, you know, are the DS DOD giving up the best and brightest to go to the intel agencies and vice versa? Are we, from a personnel standpoint, is this joint duty working the way that you intended it? Uh, Congressman, I'll take a, a first crack at this. Uh, it, in, in my experience, uh, the joint duty program for intelligence officers um, really has sought to model a lot of the successes of the joint, uh, joint tours of duty on the military side under Goldwater Nichols, uh, which have been successful in driving that integration over the last 30 years for the military. Uh, the same is starting to play out in the intelligence joint duty program. Um, my observation is that uh, in almost all cases, uh, individuals who serve a joint duty uh, gain experiences that make them far more valuable and developed as leaders for the intelligence community uh, upon completion of that joint duty tour. That said, one of the things that we need to continue to work on in the years ahead is how to make that uh, 
in and out or the, the return back to the home organization um, even, even more effective so that in a seamless way they're able to come back to their home organization to the right kind of job that fully leverages that joint assignment. Right. We've had to go to school on this a bit on managing uh, this arrangement. It's obviously easier and more convenient when you uh, manage a workforce that's self-contained within a particular agency. Um, I know in my own headquarters where we have uh, maintained of 40% uh, of our workforce are detailees from other components. And you do have to pay attention to that, manage their assignments, ensure they get uh, appropriate ratings and, uh, and bonuses where appropriate. And I think, though, that the, uh, the enrichment of the force and the professional capability uh, of the force is far better. You know, there's been really a profound sociological change in the entire intelligence community. There are thousands of employees who have deployed multiple, civilian employees who have deployed multiple times uh, since 9-11. Uh, and that has had, I think, a, a profound change in the professionalism and uh, identification with the mission all right. uh, of our civilian employees. All right, all right. Director Trapper, thank Time you. Time the gentleman has expired. Let me go. Mr. Quigley is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your service. Mr. Clapper, a word of advice. You talk about retirement. You mentioned your wife. A friend of mine recently retired, and his wife said, I married you for better or worse, but I didn't marry you for lunch. So good luck on that. Uh, in the time we have, could you give us a little bit uh, of your thoughts concerning the homeland and security? Uh, what, is, what are your priorities or chief concerns besides cyber or Orlando-type attacks? Uh, to me, it's a concern that the attacks could be more... Um, generated from outside, but also less sophisticated and therefore harder to stop or even know about? Well, you've uh, touched on what is, uh, of course, a great concern to us, the, uh, not so much the massive complex attack that we suffered on 9-11, but rather those caused by individuals or small cells of people. Uh, that is a, uh, a tremendous challenge for us. Um, one of the things I've uh, tried to work in my time as uh, DNI is promoting not only the horizontal integration across our IC agencies, but also vertically with this uh, state, local, tribal, and private sector. I think we've made a lot of improvement there. Um, I uh, will, for example, be meeting with my uh, Homeland Security and Law Enforcement uh, Advisory Group tonight, which is an outstanding group of uh, uh, chiefs of police and, uh, uh, and law enforcement intelligence uh, representatives uh, who do great work. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, the creation and operation of fusion center network across the country, which are uh, increasingly becoming internetted, uh, is a great bulwark uh, against uh, uh, foreign attacks. But I do, uh, I will leave this job uh, concerned about uh, the impact of uh, so-called lone wolves uh, or homegrown violent extremism. Um, that is a very complex problem. It requires, I think, uh, first and foremost, uh, community involvement. Um, I think intelligence law enforcement can do, only, can do so much uh, to help uh, uh, clarify the picture on what that threat is. Congressman, may, may I just add that uh, in addition to the counterterrorism and cyber types of threats that the director um, uh, mentioned, on the military side, we also think about threats to the homeland um, from more traditional military capabilities, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and so forth. And one of uh, the main projects we have underway is to look at how to improve our intelligence indications and warning uh, to be able to better respond to those types of contingencies as well. So I think it's important to think about the full spe spectrum of uh, threats to the homeland that we face. And I've heard several talk about uh, the effects of sequestration on our um, protection of the homeland. What concerns me, and if you could add a thought, uh, and I know it doesn't come out of this committee necessarily, but homeland security grants to local governments cut by 50% roughly in the last five years. Transportation security grants, 75 percent. 
the infrastructure aspects like setbacks and ballards were zeroed out. Uh, your thoughts, if, if you may? Well, um, sequestration is a, uh, the specter of, of sequestration, which of course runs through 2021, uh, continues. And it has impact across, potentially has impact uh, across uh, the board. Uh, and that's something we, uh, you know, we struggle with uh, every, every program year. And of course, the, uh, the uncertainty that creates and uh, the painful trades we, we have to make, uh, you know, that's, that's a fact of life. And uh, it's got to be, it's, programmatically, it's gotten to be the new normal now. We've been living with it for about five years. Thank you. Thank you all. Mr. Pompeo is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, questions are for Director Clapper and Deputy Secretary Work. I sit on a joint task force along with Mr. Calvert and Mr. Wenstrup that was looking into the manipulation of intelligence at Central Command. Have both of you had a chance to read the interim report that the task force filed? Uh, you, you mean the committee report? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've read it. Mr. Work? I've not read it in detail, sir. <clears throat> In, in that, there are pretty clear uh, cases of intelligence manipulation. And my question is, what accountability for any person associated with that has been held to date? Mr. Work? Uh, sir, uh, what we have been waiting on is the completion of the IG investigation. Mr. Work, it's been, just for the record, it's two years. We have soldiers in the field. And we had intelligence that wasn't getting to the right place to keep these young men and women safe so that we could make good policy decisions. It's been two years. To tell a soldier that you're waiting on an IG report is unacceptable. Tell me who's been held accountable. Um, I would have to ask uh, Under Secretary of uh, Defense Letcher if any particular people have been held accountable. What the Secretary and I have said over and over and over again, we expect the highest standards in the intelligence community. Did we get that, Mr. Work? Um, Did well, our soldiers get that? The IG report will tell us, but as Director Clapper spoke to uh, the overall assessment is that we are improving. Congressman, I'll just add, uh, we are not able to take uh, authoritative um, personnel-related actions on, on these instances and allegations until the IG investigation is done. It has taken quite a while. Uh, I think we are as, um, we are as eager as, as this committee is to get the results of that IG investigation and be able to take action on those. Uh, in the interim, there are some uh, systemic and management uh, act actions that we have taken uh, on the DOD side, working closely with Director Clapper and his team. Um, first and foremost, as Director Clapper mentioned, in the natural change changeover of duties at Central Command with the commander and the J-2, uh, we both have, uh, along with General Stewart, the director of DIA, strongly emphasized uh, the need for the J-2 um, to look at its business practices and ensure that all analysts have the ability to call it like they see it and speak truth to power. Uh, in addition, more broadly across the enterprise, we've taken a number of initiatives to reinforce the importance of analytic integrity. We're in the process of ensuring that every organization has an analytic ombudsman in place, someone that analysts can come to anonymously and report concerns that they may have and have an advocate to senior well, leaders I'm, and a number I'm, of I'm other glad, initiatives. I'm glad you're doing areas. those things. Those all sound great to me. Um, I have to tell you that the American people and our soldiers and sailors, airmen and Marines deserve not to wait two years to hold accountable folks who put bad information in the field. Uh, Director Clapper, there are reports, uh, press reports that indicate that there was information withheld from a presidential uh, daily briefing uh, until after General Austin had testified. Are you aware of the reports? And if so, are those reports accurate? Uh, I'm aware of the reports and uh, the uh uh, examination done by uh, our analytic integrity officer didn't find any uh, uh, substantiation of that. There are also press reports, Director Clapper, that you had, uh, and, and our, t our task force also um, looked into this, that you had direct conversations with General Groves with great frequency, uh, circumventing the chain of command there, uh, and yet you testified that, um, uh, quote, intelligence, this was before the Senate Armed Services Committee, intelligence assessments from CENTCOM come to the national level only through the DIA. How do you square conversations that you're having with uh, the J-2 at one command with that testimony? The conversations I had with the J-2 by VTC were uh, only for tactical updates. Uh, 
not to discuss uh, broad assessments. Um, the, and I will also comment that in every one of these, there was a split screen, and the JCSJ2 was always represented in, in the, these dialogues. What, so the reference to uh, assessments finding their way into, say, national intelligence estimates or PDB articles is done through the Defense Intelligence Agency, not direct from CENTCOM or any other uh, combatant command. Great. Thank you, Director Clapper. Uh, Director Clapper, uh, President Obama removed Iran Air's designation as a proliferator of weapons of mass destruction on January 15, 2016, as part of the JCPOA. Did Iran Air's activities change in any way to prompt this removal? Uh, I believe, uh, if, if I'm correct, Iran is still a state sponsor of terrorism. I don't think we've reclassified Iran. Right, no, that's my question. But the President removed Iran Air's designation as a proliferator of weapons of mass destruction and a provider of material support to the IRGC as part of the JCPOA, or simultaneously with the JCPOA, more properly. Can you tell me if Iran Air's behavior changed in any way or has changed to justify such a removal? Um, I can't say that uh, Iran's behavior is, uh, has changed. Uh, it has continued uh, aggressive uh, missile uh, development and missile fielding. Um, I think in terms of its uh, proliferating uh, to other countries, uh, I don't think, I, I can't, I'd have to research that and provide on a classified basis uh, if we have information on that. Thank you, Director Clapper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Himes is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I want to devote my five minutes to um, the topic of cybersecurity. Uh, and in particular, uh, let me start with you, Director Clapper, and, and thank you for your service. Um, we, we really appreciate all that you have done over the length of a long career. I'd like to start with you. Let, let me give you the bulk of the time here. What I'm really interested in is not achievements and, and the progress we've made, because clearly we have with the Integration Center and everything else, but as you think about withdrawing from the field, what would you identify as the top most specific weaknesses, unaddressed vulnerabilities, areas of focus for both the IC and this committee in terms of our defense against cyber threats? Um, well, we need to, uh, uh, we, I think, make a very healthy investment in the National Intelligence Program on uh, intelligence to support uh, cyber threats. Obviously, it would always be not good to have more money, but uh, I think it's as, a, as a, a proportion of everything else that we have to look at, I think we're in reasonable good shape. I think the, the, the challenge for us is, uh, is always going to be the, fu the fundamental fact that the Internet is insecure. And, and any time you have a dependency on the Internet, uh, we're going to have a, a, we're going to be playing catch up and, re and reaction uh, to uh, defending uh, our, our networks. Um, the other issue I, I would mention is uh, the creation of both the substance and the psychology, I guess, of uh, deterrence uh, in, the, in, the cyber, uh, in the cyber realm. That's been uh, a challenge. Um, the uh, issue there is whether you react on a uh, binary basis uh, or symmetrical basis. Uh, if you, you have a cyber assault and you react in a cyber context, or do you uh, retaliate some other way? Uh, I think that uh, that is going to be a challenge for the, for the country. Uh, is our uh, the? Could I just stop you there and ask a question? Is the challenge there as you identify it one of the development of doctrine, or is it a technical issue? I think it's more a uh, development of uh, a doctrine and, uh, and policy and uh, developing a body of law through uh, experience. Um, you know, it took hundreds of years to develop the uh, law of the sea, which is uh, maybe a, a rough analog uh, to 
uh, where we are with cyber, and we haven't had enough time yet, I think, to develop uh, that body of law. And that, uh, until such time as there are some norms developed, and we have a firm definition of what deterrence means, and that that's recognized by both state and non-state actors, uh, we're going to have a problem with uh, cyber defense. Let, let, let me ask one specific question on the topic. Um, the committee spent, obviously, a great deal of time in the creation of the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act. Um, how are we doing with respect to the private sector working with security agencies to address the, uh, the cyber threat? Is there enough communication there? Is there more that can be done? I, I, think, uh, I think there is. Uh, we, uh, and this is a, a shared responsibility across uh, the IC, uh, the FBI is involved, is, and, and, and of course, uh, very importantly, uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, this too, I mean, when you say engagement with the private sector is uh, that's as big as all outdoors, and uh, finding the right uh, and and keeping active uh, the right conduits so that uh, we can share. And by the way, the sharing needs to be two ways, both from them to us, and and from them and from us to them. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of improvement that has been made. I think the Department of Homeland Security has made huge strides here. That's not to say there's not more to do. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Oh, yeah, uh, Mr. Mr. Ward. A couple things. In terms of cybersecurity, the number one thing we're trying to do is secure our networks. We've made a lot of uh, progress on this. We're also building up our cyber workforce. We should be uh, have all of the cyber mission teams uh, in FY17. Uh, and making sure we have the right people. The other thing we're really worried about now and we're looking at hard are the Internet of DOD things. All of our weapon systems that we generally operate today were designed in an era where cybersecurity threats were not all that uh, uh, stressing. So going through all of the different systems that we have, identifying the cyber vulnerabilities and prioritizing those uh, has been a big uh, focus on the department. We have a cyber sword card that is briefed to the secretary and I uh, every month to six weeks and we are looking at all of these different factors on trying to improve our cyber security. We have a long way to go but we've made a lot of progress. Thank you. Thank you. Heel back. Mr. Heels back. Mr. Calvert's recognized. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you Mr. Clapper for your service. We've known each other for a number of years. I'd like to get back into this the CINCOM discussion and the reason why we uh, we, we investigated this in the first place. As you remember, uh, General Jim Mattis uh, left abruptly uh, in 2013. Uh, there, the Director of Intelligence pretty much remained in place for the first part of 2014 uh, under General uh, Austin. Uh, and around June, um, that changed. Uh, there was a turnover of people over at CENTCOM. And intelligence started coming out uh, regarding Mosul, which is, again, in the news today, uh, which was inaccurate. I think everybody can look back at that now and say, yeah, Mosul did fall. It didn't, uh, uh, it didn't, uh, didn't have the capabilities that some people thought. But it, the intelligence since then uh, has, been in, has been in dispute. Uh, as you know, 40% of the workforce, twice the number of typical combatant commands felt uh, that their analysts, uh, their analysts, the, the final product has been somewhat distorted. Uh, and, uh, and through our review, they, uh, many of those employees to this day believe that the culture uh, at CENTCOM uh, has been somewhat uh, toxic, to use the word that, uh, that came up time and time again. Uh, right now, we're back in. Mosul again. Uh, we have people there. Uh, how do we know that the intelligence that's coming out of CENTCOM today uh, is any more reliable than the intelligence that was coming out two years ago? Well, we, we don't depend only on CENTCOM for uh, uh, intelligence reporting. In fact, one of the reasons why I do consult with them is to, is to ensure that we are on the same page. So we have other uh, assets uh, national assets that uh, tell us whether uh, what we're seeing uh, operationally or what we're hearing uh, reported operationally 
uh, comports with what we're seeing through intelligence. And uh, at least my observations through the current Mosul campaign are that they, they do. Well, as you know, we have the largest number of folks uh, working in intelligence at, at CENTCOM than any of the combatant commands. It's, uh, uh, we spend quite a bit of money, uh, appropriate quite a bit of money to make sure that uh, these folks are uh, well equipped and well manned to make sure that they provide the best intelligence to the warfighter and to the combatant commander as possible. Are you confident that that's occurring today, that the intelligence is coming out of CENTCOM has improved because I, don't, I think it's beyond dispute that we had a problem two years ago. And uh, is that problem been cleared up and is it continuing to, to get cleared up right now? It's I'm somewhat removed from the, from the command, but from what I've observed, uh, that's the case. And uh, I don't know if you were, you were here, sir, earlier when I quoted uh, the latest statistics from our analytic survey, which are, l reflect a positive trend. And so the people, the number of respondents uh, reflecting uh, analytic integrity issues has declined. And importantly, the, their comments on management response when they did have issues has increased. And so that the uh, behavior, uh, the, the re reflections of this at CENTCOM uh, are beginning to level out and comport with uh, all the other uh, combatant commands. I do think there is, uh, by virtue of the change in the commanders and the change in the J-2, uh, that uh, that has been uh, uh, a change in the atmosphere there. And so I've been encouraged by uh, the trends, uh, particularly this year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to tell the members we have three votes now and then a motion to recommit of 10 minutes of debate. So I'm going to try to keep this open through those three votes where members can try to go and come back, so if, if possible. But then at the end of the motion to recommit, we'll have to end the hearing. Mr. Murphy's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your time. Uh, back to cyber real quick. Uh, Director Clapper, how important do you think it is that we have some sort of uh, rules of engagement with cyber that uh, adversaries know, whether they're state-sponsored or not, that they know that there will be a response, that there are, that we move out of this gray area. How important is that? Well, again, this gets to the point about uh, developing a, a body of law and, and uh, conveying those messages uh, is much easier with nation states mm -hmm. uh, because uh, everyone recognizes that you know, there are mutual vulnerabilities. The greater challenge, for, at least for my part, is on non-nation non -nation state entities, which over time are going to develop uh, more uh, capabilities in the cyber realm to uh, commit to render attacks. And so I think the notion of building a sense of deterrence, the psychology of deterrence in non-nation state entities, entities is going to be difficult. Uh, I think there's certainly progress with, uh, uh, with the Chinese uh, as a result of the agreement that was struck uh, uh, in September uh, of 15. And uh, we'll have to see whether that, uh, that is continued. But the, I think the greater challenge is uh, non-nation state entities. With things moving as quickly as they do with technology, cyber, how has your experience been, and, and do you feel as director, for recruiting the best talent in the world to make sure we are a step ahead? I think we uh, have sustained our level of uh, recruitment, and we, we continue to be able to bring uh, great young people in, into uh, the community. The greater challenge, though, is retention. And they'll come to us either uh, as young civilians or uh, military, and then they they become very, very attractive and very appealing to a uh, commercial sector. Right. And so then we, uh, we, have a, we have a challenge there with retaining people uh, in the face of some uh, pretty appealing uh, compensation packages that uh, a lot of our people that have had experience in the intelligence community get, uh, and that makes them very uh, attractive. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, pick your brain just briefly and what you think and, and, and based on your experience, 
uh, over the next five to ten years, the greatest threats we face as a nation, uh, what we are doing to address that and what we should be doing, especially uh, with a new administration coming in. What, what is your advice, big picture, to them? Are you speaking only of cyber or just general? In general. Well, um, that's a hard question to, to answer because uh, from an intelligence perspective, we have to uh, be alert to all of these threats. Uh, I wish I could rank them and uh, pick and choose which ones to worry about, but uh, unfortunately, um, they're all uh, a problem for us. So whether it's uh, the nation state uh, challenges posed by the likes of Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, or uh, transnational concerns like counterterrorism, like proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, which is uh, personally a growing concern uh, for me, uh, the challenges posed in the, in the cyber uh, dimension. Uh, we have to, and our approach has been to try to maintain a balance so that we can uh, detect and address the full range of threats. So I'd be, uh, I'm hesitant to try to pick one that says this is, this is the one that's going to confront us or is going to be the worst, the worst for us over the next five or ten years. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Winstrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that things are better at CENCOM. I have served on that investigation. And uh, clearly we have uh, concerns about what went on in 2015. And I know that's been addressed to, to some degree. Uh, Secretary Work, what are the root causes, in your opinion, of the unacceptable climate, uh, command climate that was existing at CETCOM during that time? Well, this is something that Secretary Carter and I have discussed. Uh, you know, we want to know what happened and why it happened. Uh, we have been looking to uh, Director Clapper and Under Secretary of Defense uh, uh, Lettra to say, look, this, was, uh, this is what we think the problems were. We have really uh, tried to get after it. Um, the thing that the Secretary and I, trying to stay above the IG investigation, is simply to say we expect, we expect all of our intel analysts to have full freedom to say what they uh, need to say, to speak truth to power. We expect the chain of command to uh, pass that information up the chain. Every decision we make on the campaign is based on the assumption of good intelligence. So it's very important to us, and we're awaiting uh, the judgments of the intelligence professionals on how we can improve. When do you expect that we will get that? I mean, this, is, this has been quite a while. We've gotten a lot of information just on, on our committee and, and our investigation. Uh, open source news has provided much information. When do you expect that we're going to get something back? Because it's hard to right or wrong if you just keep playing around with it. And how do we avoid it from happening again if, we are, if we're taking way too much time in figuring out why it happened and where it happened? And we've pretty much honed it down to the section in the chain where things seem to change. So what are we waiting for? Why is this taking so long? When we have gathered so much information, and this isn't even our full-time job to investigate it. So one of the hardest jobs it is as a senior leader in the department is to be patient when, the, uh, when these type of investigations are ongoing. I can't tell you exactly when it will be finished. Well, I don't know that you should be patient, actually. I think that it's, it's time that we come forward, let the American people know what was taking place, at least let this committee understand what has been taking, had been taking place. Hopefully it is corrected. Um, Frankly, I'm surprised that you're content with 25% in the survey as being an acceptable number. I would be shooting for a lot less than that. Um, but, uh, and you're free to c c comment, uh, Mr. Clapper, Director Clapper, if you'd like to. Well, uh, just, I think it's a good thing to bear in mind here that uh, we're having, uh, this is a debate about subjective subjects. Um, where there can be room for uh, honest uh, analytic disagreement because we're always uh, operating from uh, incomplete or less than perfect facts. And so uh, uh, people uh, who uh, are experts in this can have and do have uh, 
um, honest disagreements. So I don't find the figure, again, given the subje subjectivity of the, uh, of the subject matter, uh, I don't find that uh, alarming, and that is pretty much on, on a par uh, with, with the behavior. I'd be more concerned if it were zero, uh, if there were no disagreement, uh, no dissent anywhere, any time, that, that, uh, uh, that would be disturbing to me. I'd want to know why that's so. I, uh, I can understand that argument for the 25 percent, but I sure can't for the 40 percent. Sir, that just doesn't fly in the face of what's going on at the other commands, and it's certainly unacceptable. And the fact that we've had so many whistleblowers come forward certainly speaks volumes. And, uh, you know, we have an, uh, an obligation here to have oversight. Lives depend on this, as you well know. Lives depend on the type of reporting that, that's going up. So we've had plenty of testimony on our side there certainly should be something that the IG should, should come forward with us and, and very soon not just try to run out the clock. And you, I would think that before you go, sir, that this is something you would want to have resolved and taken care of. Uh, yes, it is, sir, because uh, your report uh, took me and the rest of the intelligence community to task for seemingly sitting on our hands and not doing anything, not taking any corrective action about this when we were enjoined not to. Uh, because of the, of the DODIG. And so, yes, I would like it very much uh, to get resolved, I think, uh, uh, in the interest of uh, General Grove, who has since moved on to another assignment, uh, exactly what uh, uh, the IG finds would be very important and would be great if uh, uh, it happened before I leave. And if I may, I, just need, I do need to clarify about my statement about re resignation. It's not effective until noon on 20 January 2017, not immediate, as has been being reported in the media. Well, I appreciate your time and service to the country, and I hope that this is uh, wrapped, up, wrapped up and rectified so that we can move forward in a positive way before you leave, sir. Thank you, and I yield back. General yields back. Mr. Castro is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony this morning. Director Clapper, thank you for your service to the nation in this role and so many others before it. We appreciate it very much. Uh, we've just come off of uh, un unprecedented intrusion by foreign government in our democratic process uh, after an election that finished just last week, and also unprecedented intrusion by a director within our own intelligence community in our democratic process. So based on those two things, I have a few questions. The first is, do we know whether the Russian government or those responsible for the hacking of the Democratic National Committee and other Democratic groups shared any information with any American or Americans during the last year, year and a half? Uh, <clears throat> so I'd rather not respond right off the top of my head. And, and I, in any event, uh, this would probably be best left to a classified session. OK, thank you. I'll be sure to follow up with you all on that. Uh, the second question is, as head of the U.S. intelligence community, do you believe that Director Comey breached any protocol in his actions during the last month? I have no reason to uh, question uh, Director Comey. I, I have, I think, extremely highly of, of him. And so whatever uh, actions he took, uh, he did so in what he felt was uh, best. And I have no basis for questioning that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I pass. Thank you, Mr. Castro. Um, I'm gonna, I don't know if Mr. Schiff is coming back or not, but I'm going to get back to uh, some of the remaining questions that I have, so I'll just try to get through them quickly. Uh, sec uh, Secretary Work, are you familiar um, uh, with the decision by UCOM in 2011 uh, where the requirement for the new intelligence center was to be an hour outside of London? I do know that an AOA that was conducted by uh, the European Command suggested that we should consolidate the JIAC at uh, RAF Croughton. Yes, sir. Right, but the requirement was specifically to be an hour outside of London. Are you aware of this requirement? Uh, I'm not aware of a specific requirement. I know of the AOA and the uh, analysis that was done to support the move. Mr. Clapper, D Director Clapper, are you aware of the requirement to be an hour outside of London? 
Uh, no, I'm not. So we learned, this committee has learned through the investigation that the decision was made before an AOA uh, was ever completed. And as the GAO found, uh, there's no, the, G, the GAO cla claims that uh, despite, despite DOD's claims that they looked at 16 locations, 15 of the 16 uh, alternatives, there's no documentation on 15 of the 16 other alternatives other than Crowton, because 15, do um, you know what happened to this documentation? No, sir. I do know that the uh, GAO investigation occurred approximately six years after that was uh, done. Uh, so one of the things they did say that uh, we were lacking documentation, but the most important uh, conclusion that they made was that our actions were sufficiently reliable for the purpose of describing DOD's rationale for choosing RAF Crowton at the location for JIAC consolidation. That, to me, is a pretty much slam dunk except to the fact that this committee cannot find any documentation of any work being done on 15 of the 16 sites that you supposedly looked at. Sir, all I can say is that five, three different secretaries of defense, five four-star combatant commanders, one Navy, one Air Force, two Army, one Marine, two undersecretaries of defense for intelligence, the, per, the, the current P, uh, DNI, the current PDNI, we've had three successive AOAs, these AOAs were looked at in an audit by the GAO, and they said that our conclusions were sufficiently reliable for the purpose of making our decision. Uh, so in my view, we've looked at this three different times. Uh, Congress itself has agreed with our finding by uh, funding phase one of the project, and uh, they also approved phase two, subject to my determination and certification that we spoke to earlier. So it's okay, you think it's okay that there is no evidence that shows that you ever looked at 15 of the 16 sites? Well, I'll have to go back and look at all, uh, it was described by GAO, Mr. Chairman, as the DOD body of evidence. Another finding straight out of the GAO report is DOD has provided the required information in response to committee direction and statutory provisions. So well, we, ha we have evidence that a commander's decision brief was done in 2011 where the requirement was an, outside of, out, an hour outside of London, and we've had people testify to that fact. After the fact, it just appears like there's, there's no information. So despite, you can do all the studies you want, but if you have people come to this committee and say, well, we're not going to give Congress the answers because we don't like the tone of a letter, uh, you delay those answers. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, there's, there's just no evidence here that shows that essentially someone just wanted to go to Crowton back in 2011, and that's the decision that was made then, and everything since then, there's no documentation to document why that decision was made. Let me go to uh, Director, back to Dr. Director Clapper. Uh, in, on July 27, 2015, I visited you in your office and informed you that a whistleblower had approached the committee indicating that false information had been provided to the committee regarding the Intelligence Center. Do you remember that meeting? Uh, yes. In the same meeting, uh, and again on March 21st, you, this year you told Chairman Thornberry, Chairman, Chairman Freelandheisen, and myself, if we move the Intelligence Center outside of the London suburbs, that IC civilians and contractors would not move to the new location. Can you explain why that's the case? No, I don't think I said that, sir. I think what I said was that uh, based on briefings I had received at Jack Molesworth that the uh, civilians there uh, probably would not move to Lodges. That was a specific reference, but a general statement that they wouldn't go anywhere else, I, I don't believe I ever said that. Oh, so only Lodges. So they would go other places, but not Lodges. Well, I, I, I don't know. The, the, the specific issue that I was briefed on was the reaction to the possibility of a move to Lodges Air Base in the Azores. And this was a briefing by DOD civilians or contractors? No, this was a briefing from the commander when I visited there uh, sometime, I'm, I'm not sure when. The commander of the, the intelligence center of the JAC said that civilians 
the civilians would not move to lodges? Well, yes. Uh, you know, like, uh, th these are older people, you know, that have children in schools, uh, particularly high school age, and uh, I don't think the, the, the general re the reaction to that, but to move to an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean was, was not very positive. And, of course, uh, that's been compounded by the uh, Section 414 of, uh, the, of the Intelligence Authorization Act, uh, taking away their housing allowance, which is a, a very discriminatory and very obje uh, 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 negative uh, impact, not only on DI civilians, but on uh, uh, IC employees in general. So it sounds like we are making decisions based on where people want to live. No, I had, I, I, you know, this whole issue of moving or not was kind of a wash to me. Uh, I didn't get involved in it until there, there was some potential for expense to the National Intelligence Program. And of course, as I got into this and discovered with the potential morale impacts and the fact that people uh, would probably not take their families to Lodges Air Base. In, in light of the facilities you, that they uh, were, knew weren't there. Are you aware that the Azor Islands are a popular vacation spot for people from the U.S. and, and Europe and have daily flights? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, do we have trouble getting people to move to Hawaii? Actually, we do, because uh, there are uh, issues there with uh, 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 compensation for the very high cost of living. So that, that's problematic as well. But the cost of the living in the Azores is low. So why would that, so it doesn't seem to have that problem. I mean, both are vacation spots. Well, I think, you're talking about Hawaii? Yeah. Last I checked, Hawaii was a popular vacation spot. Oh, it is. A, a, it's a very popular vacation spot vacation spot. So you spend a lot of money for a week or two, but living there permanently, supporting a family, uh, that sort of thing. I've spent two tours in Hawaii and it's quite expensive. So the Azores is also a vacation spot and it has the cheapest cost of living in Western Europe. Why would that not be a place that people would well, go Well, in Hawaii there are uh, high schools and there are medical facilities and there are PXs and commissaries and uh, that, that's kind of lacking right now at Lodges. Well, uh, last I checked, I don't think there's anything uh, lacking there through our, uh, the work that we've done at this committee. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Schiff is going to be back or not. Have we heard? Is he on his way back? Okay. Um, gentlemen, I want to thank you for appearing here today. Uh, the committee re remains uh, deeply concerned about these issues. Uh, we look forward to the IG CENTCOM report uh, and the IG's report on false information and misleading information provided to Congress. Uh, hopefully the IG can get to the bottom of these problems and help the committee uncover uh, what exactly has happened here. Uh, our robust oversight will continue uh, the remainder of this year and into the next Congress. But I want to thank all of you for your service and for your attendance here today. Meetings adjourned. Here's adjourned. <laughs>